I am Jean-François Clairvoy, astronaut of the European Space Agency. I flew three times in space, first time to study the atmosphere, the second time to resupply the Russian space station Mir, the third time to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, three times on board the US Space Shuttle, and I am also currently managing the program of what we call parabolic flight. These are flights with airliner, it's an Airbus 310. During those flights, we recreate the real weightlessness on board. We literally inject the aircraft into the arc of an orbit, but since it happens inside the atmosphere, we need a special piloting technique, but it works. So I am currently still active astronaut, but soon I will retire, and I am also selling weightlessness to scientists and also to tourists. Jean-Francois, it's a pleasure of having you as, as our guest for this interview. Uh, we've been talking just before going on, on the camera how thin the atmosphere looks uh, from the International Space Station or from space. From space in general. When you well, look what at does the that Earth, mean? How does it change uh, the mindset when you go there? You know, when you look at the Earth, the first striking impression, it is beautiful. And the view makes you think, uh, who created that Earth? It looks more beautiful than any painter or artist top in the world could imagine. It's round, it's isolated, it's limited, finite, in the vacuum of space, empty to infinity. You don't see stars if you don't switch off the lights because your eyes are not adapted enough to obscurity. And then, uh, you know, the horizon is about 2,500 kilometers away from us. And when you look at the atmosphere from a side, relative to the size of the Earth, you realize it's extremely thin. And life as we know it on Earth, you, me, humans, animals, vegetables, life in the forest, underwater, depends on that thin layer of gas. That's when you realize life on Earth is very fragile. Not Earth itself. Earth will survive us. When you see hurricanes, volcanoes, thunderstorms from space, you realize that Earth has its own climatic, geologic, tectonic life, including cosmics. You see impacts of asteroids that have happened in the past, long time ago, but they are there. So you, it will happen again in the time it's... Sometime in the future. In the future. So either it's not important for human race, humankind to disappear one day, but if we think... As the dinosaurs did once? Yes. As the dinosaurs. You know why they disappeared? Because they didn't have a space program. But we humans are smart enough to be capable to imagine spaceship to eventually transport humankind to some other place. It's not urgent now, but at some point, if we want the human species to survive when the Earth becomes uninhabitable because the Earth, the, the sun has inflated too much and the Earth becomes too hot, uh, we can learn to live on Mars and eventually on planets around other stars then we can, we can save the human kind race. If we continue uh, exploiting the resources of our planet in the, that in the should not be the reason. Doing. The reason why we should be forced to leave our planet is when natural elements will make Earth not livable. Not habitable. It should not be our own cause. If we are responsible of the destruction of our own species, including animals, vegetables, that would be bad because it would be against what I think is the destiny of humankind. I am optimistic. I believe at some point humans will be conscious and responsible enough to take the actions needed to stop destroying our planet as a spaceship in itself. We astronauts in space, we don't want to lack oxygen, electricity, water before the end of the mission. And it is possible on Earth to not consume more than what nature gives us every day, every year, with the sun, with nature. We just have to learn to make it properly. And in order to manage Earth as a spaceship, we should do it like we do for our own spaceship. How do we manage a spaceship? We learn first how it works. For this, we have a lot of satellites studying Earth ocean, atmosphere, salinity, temperature, winds, uh, forest, 
to understand how Earth as a geologic, climatic object works. Second, we should decide rules how to use that spaceship. And we can find the rules that will make Earth livable for a long time. And then we should cooperate with each other. We should feel we are all crew members of one unique crew of Spaceship Earth. And space flight helps for that, like the space station. On board the space station, we have Russians, Americans, Japanese, Canadian, 10 countries of Europe working together with no one influence from ge the geopolitical tensions on Earth in the way we work. We work as brothers and sisters. We help each other. You have Russian spaceship transporting US astronauts for the last 10 years. Maybe that's one of the, the few workplaces anywhere on, on or around the planet where we see that kind of cooperation between yes. the countries. Do you think there is space for every single nation in space? Uh, you know, sp space flight, human space flight, is an excellent place to learn about each other, to learn and accept the difference of culture, of language, but still achieve a common goal. We are different, but our goal is the same. And because the goal is the same, and because we trust each other, we can achieve great things. And that's something we could do on Earth too. But we have to become more wise than what we are today. Or maybe many, many other people need to go into space and see the, the world from oh, the angle that you, you have seen it. If you ask an astronaut, what is your best wish? And many will answer, I wish every human being would have a chance once in their lifetime to see Earth from space. Because then they, when they come back, they will feel member of one crew and they will think differently and act differently and defend the cause of the whole humankind and the whole ecosystem. Because humankind by itself is not enough. There is a whole biodiversity that makes humankind, uh, you know, able to live. That would definitely make the world a better place to, to live. You've been in space three times. What are the most important lessons that you've learned from, uh, from your travels? Around? From my three travel in space, I've learned first we can do it. We can do things that appear totally foolish and incredible. I mean, going to space requires mastering very high technology with a high level of energy. 45 gigawatt of mechanical power at liftoff, which is the equivalent of the whole electrical power delivered in France, typically in September time frame. In the summer it's more 30, now it's a bit cold, so people turn on their heaters in the north, so we are around 55, 60 gigawatt uh, consumption of electrical power right now. So it's enormous. We can do it. Second, we can learn how to work together and accept our differences in a noble common goal, which is exploration. Exploration is going where we have never been before to learn what is there because it helps answering questions where do we come from who are we what is our destiny and third space is helping us answering a lot of questions about how earth works as a spaceship in itself as a natural spaceship so you're obviously a, a believer in uh, space exploration. Uh, while listening to you, I'm hearing the words of Captain Kirk that, that you actually showed us from, uh, from Star Trek. Do you believe that uh, people, rich people like Elon Musk, like uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, like uh, Richard Branson, who are actually pouring a lot of money into um, putting that technology that we already have into work, do you think and in what time frame that we will be able to actually go to, to the planets or even outside of, uh, of our solar system, which is really difficult? You know, I, I like the fact that very rich people, when they wonder, what could I do with my money? The first idea that comes to their mind is space. Because they understand that they have a responsibility in acting in favor of the future of human space, uh, space uh, of humankind. But going to space is very hard. It's very risky. It's very expensive because it requires a lot of energy. Maybe in a few decades from now, when it becomes more regular, we fly a lot, and we find technology to make it less expensive, less risky, it will open wider 
to the general public. But so far, we can easily access the Earth's space environment, including the Moon. The Moon is part of the Earth's influence. Moon is orbiting the Earth because it is attracted by the Earth. Maybe the, there's one system. It's one big system. Yeah. But maybe in the 30s, 40s, in 20, 30 years from now, we will send the first humans to Mars. And this is another story. For the first time in humankind life, people will not see the Earth anymore will not be able to talk to the Earth and will not be able to come back within hours or days as it has been the case since the beginning of human spaceflight with Yuri Gagarin. From the moon it takes two or three days. From the time you decide to go back on Earth, the time you are on Earth. From a low Earth orbit like the space station, it takes few hours. But going to Mars, it takes few months minimum before you can imagine being back on Earth. Is the major problem propulsion and uh, creating the amount of energy needed for this travel, uh, for this journey from Earth to Mars? To go to Mars, we can use the technology we master today. We know we can send humans for one, two years in space. We know what it takes to make them be able to work and live and come back healthy. That's about the limit. And it will be still using chemical energy for the initial power to give the velocity in our time frame. But in the far future, maybe at the end of this century or later on, we'll probably be able to develop new technology to go to Mars quicker using uh, highly powerful plasma engines, which are more efficient than chemical engines and maybe make the flight less risky. But in our time frame, Mars is reachable, but still with a lot of constraints. That's why it will be reserved to professional astronauts. But flying to other planets than Mars, I mean to Jupiter and Saturn, it's far in the future. And going to other solar systems, it's within a few centuries, I guess. But it is it's not impossible. Yeah. It is today science fiction, but we know the law of physics. We know what it takes. We are not ready today. But we will be ready to go to Mars in the next 20, 30 years. We will be ready to go to the moon of Jupiter and Saturn that are very interesting to look for other life. You know, we search for life. Our, the, our main goal of exploration is to search for other life in the universe than on Earth. And maybe in a few centuries, we will go to other stars. Uh, perhaps you are also a fan of science fiction, I guess. As, yes, as, 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 big uh, fan as, of Star Trek, Star Wars. Of course, yeah. as, as an astronaut. So, do you think that science fiction can turn into science fact? I mean, you already said that in the far future, maybe we'll be able to uh, begin interstellar uh, travel. But how far are we today? Science of, of, fiction. Of reaching, of reaching yeah. that goal. And actually, do, do you believe in programs like uh, SETI, searching for extraterrestrial life, because many planets have been discovered already, or at least scientists are thinking that they're, they can be habitable. Is this the way to go forward? You know, science fiction, as far as the law of physics are respected, can lead to real science and real facts. And. Uh, you know, uh, Jules Verne wrote uh, From the Earth to the Moon, uh, Hergé, Tintin, you know, Objective Moon. Uh, so many years ago. We walked on the moon and the cartoon came out before the Apollo program. It was like a prediction so, of something that's yes, going to happen. As far as you think, within respect of the law of physics, there is no reason why you should not believe science fiction can lead to reality. Uh, now, going uh, to other solar systems, we know it's difficult. It's difficult because we, with the current propulsion system, it takes centuries to go to other stars. You know, we can reach uh, 30 kilometers per second today, for 30, 40 kilometers per second. So it's a uh, hundred thousand times slower than the speed of light. So the first solar system, which is about four light year, it will take 400,000 years of travel. So we have to find dif different way of thinking, like a curvature of space-time continuum. This is not impossible. Or even wormholes, yeah. as uh, science fiction authors yeah. are, are writing about. Uh, well, yeah, do, do you believe in extraterrestrial life? But you know, the city 
it's not a question of believing or not in the SETI program. SETI is a program. It works. It is there. They have not found anything yet. And you know, a question that is often asked to astronauts is, do you believe in UFO? And that's a mix of two questions that have nothing to do with each other. Absolutely. Do you believe they are actually objects <laughs> flying above us that we don't understand? Yes. This is factual. We have, even if it's very small number of events, there are cases that are known where something has happened that has been there, observed by radars, pilots, people on the ground, yeah, and they're real. that we cannot understand with our current knowledge of you know, <laughs> physics and technology and uh, things moving very fast. <laughs> Sometimes looking like there are some intelligence on board, but we don't know what it is. And it's not because we don't know what it is that it should be extraterrestrial people. You know, the extraterrestrial uh, answer is one hypothesis. Probably not the most likely, but might be. Well, what now, I'm asking about is not little green men. Now, the other question. organic. The other life. question. Is there life out there? Is there life other places than on other places than Earth? This is a serious question because this is a main objective of our exploration programs. Yes. The main instruments all about the, the spaceship going around Mars, on Mars, going to Jupiter, Saturn, the main instruments are looking for organic activity. Like the, the spaceship we sent two years ago in Europe, uh, ExoMars, is analyzing the methane we found in the atmosphere and to find if it comes from volcanic activity or from organic, organic activity, yeah. because methane is a very good tracer of organic life. We know that if life exists, it is more likely based on the same chemicals and, than ours, because the chemicals that are the more chance to meet and interact are those that are the most common in the universe. And the most common chemicals in the universe are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, those we are made of. So the life somewhere else, if there is some, is likely to be based on carbon chemistry. They may not look, look they, they, they might not look at all like us or our own microbes or plants, but they, there is, it's probably carbon-based. The basic based. principle should be, should be there as well. Car carbon-based. You know, we find amino acid everywhere in the universe, in the solar systems, the elementary bricks of our DNA. But the mystery of how those bricks meet to make life is still a big mystery, even on Earth. You know, we have a science that is very interesting called exobiology. It's a science that studies origin of life, evolution of life so far on Earth. That's the only place where we know it. The possibility of life to exist somewhere else. The possibility of Earth life to adapt to space, like the tardigrade, I mentioned those very small, tiny animals yeah. we put outside in vacuum and they survive. And exobiology is moving along, and maybe we might find in the course of this century the answer to the fact that we are not the only place in the universe where life exists. I don't know, maybe not. So, do you believe in UFO? Is two questions. Have there been really objects flying? Yes. Are these from extraterrestrial aliens? We don't know at all, Yeah. but we search for life. We still don't understand that. Final question, because I saw that you were part of the uh, Hubble mission, the mission to repair the famous uh, telescope. Did you actually believe when you lifted off the, off the Earth that it's possible to, to rebuild uh, this technological marvel? And did you went out into space as well? Uh, I was responsible for spacewalk on my second space flight. Eventually, we didn't need to go out, so I had my own suit tested by myself in a vacuum chamber on the ground. But we didn't need to go out. On my third mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, I was the driver of the robotic arm to capture the telescope, to fix it in the cargo bay, then to move my colleagues around, inside, above, behind, and. Uh, I knew it was a challenge because in that case, for the first time in uh, spaceflight history, our target was not cooperative. I was told the telescope 
is in survival mode. We don't know what will be its orientation. We don't know how fast it will be rotating around its own axis. You find out and you fix it. So I had a big pressure. Like the, you needed to go there. To the see head it. of NASA told me the day before launch, don't forget you have six billion dollars between your hands. <laughs> but you know, I was well trained, the crew was well trained, so we, we succeeded. And thanks to that repair we did in 1999, still today the telescope is doing a great work. It, it had a small failure two weeks ago, but they fixed it, so now it's back to science, 100%. Do you miss space? Yes, you know, every astronaut uh, would like to go back to space. Any astronaut, you give a ticket, they go. But each time I flew in space, from my first commander, I learned a lesson. Be aware that you never know if you will fly again. Space flight is so rare for humans. You never know if there is a political, budget, technical, medical problem that could, that could make you not fly again in space. So each time I flew in space, I flew in my mind as if it was the last time. And I was lucky to fly three times, which is not common, you know, especially for Europeans. So I feel lucky and I feel my duty is to transmit the passion and the interest for space. But I'm ready to fly again if they find a, you know, if they need a guy like me, I go again. Thank you very much, Jean-François. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure.